It accounts for the extraordinary number of bachelors one sees all over the place. And in the second place, I don't give my consent. <laughs> Your consent? My dear fellow, Gwendolyn is my first cousin. And before I allow you to marry, you must first clear up the whole question of Cecily. Cecily? What on earth do you mean? What do you mean out of by Cecily? I don't know anyone with the name of Cecily. Bring me that cigarette case Mr. Worthing left in the smoking room the last time he dined here. Yes, sir. Do you mean to say you've had my cigarette case all this time? We should let me know. I've been writing frantic letters to Scotland Yard about it. I was very nearly offering a large reward. I wish you would not for one. I happen to be more than usually hard up at the moment. There's no good in offering a large reward now that the thing is found. <laughs> well, that is rather mean of you, Ernest, I must say. Anyhow, it makes no matter. For now that I read the inscription inside, I see that the thing isn't yours after all. Of course it's mine. You've seen me with it a hundred times. And you've no right whatsoever reading what's written inside. It's a very ungentlemanly thing to read a private cigarette case. Well, it's absurd to have a hard and fast rule about what one should read and shouldn't. More than half modern culture depends on what one shouldn't read. I'm quite aware of the fact, and I don't propose to discuss modern culture. It isn't the sort of thing one should talk of in private. Mm -hmm. I simply want my cigarette case back. Yes, but this isn't your cigarette case. This cigarette case is a present from somebody of the name of Cecily, and you said that you didn't know anyone of that name. Well, if you want to know, Cecily happens to be my aunt. Your aunt? Yes. Charm your lady, she is too. She lives in Tunbridge Wells. Just back to me, Algy. But why does she call herself Little Cecily, if she is your aunt and lives in Tunbridge Wells? From Little Cecily with her fondest love. My dear fellow, what on earth is there in that? I mean, some aunts are tall, some aunts are not tall. That is the matter that surely an aunt may be allowed to decide for herself. You seem to think that every aunt should be exactly like your aunt. Well, that's absurd. And for heaven's sake, give me back my cigarette case. Yes, but that doesn't account for the fact that your small aunt Cecily calls you her uncle. From little Cecily, with her fondest love, to her dear Uncle Jack. There is no objection, I admit, to an aunt being small, but why an aunt, no matter what her size, should call her nephew her uncle, I can't quite make out. Besides, your name isn't Jack at all. It is Ernest. It isn't Ernest. It's Jack. You have always told me that it was Ernest. I have introduced you to everybody by the name of Ernest. You answer to the name of Ernest. You even look as if your name was Ernest. You are the most earnest-looking person I ever saw in my life. It's quite absurd you're saying your name isn't Ernest. It's on your cards. Here is one of them. Yes. Mr. Ernest Worthing, before the Albany. I shall keep this as proof that your name is Ernest. If ever you attempt to deny it to me, to Gwendolyn, or to anyone else. Well, my name is Ernest in town, and Jack in the country, and the cigarette case was given to me in the country. <laughs> That does not account for the fact that your small aunt Cecily calls you her uncle. Come on, old chap. You'd much better have the whole thing out. <laughs> My dear Aldi, you talk exactly as if you were a dentist. It's very vulgar to talk like a dentist when one isn't a dentist. It produces a false impression. That is exactly what dentists always do. Now go on. Tell me the whole thing. And may I say, I have always suspected you of being a secret and confirmed bunburyist, and I am quite sure of it now. Bunburyist? <laughs> what on earth do you mean by a bunburyist? I shall reveal to you the meaning of that incomparable expression as soon as you have been kind enough to tell me why you are Ernest in town and Jack in the country. Well, produce my cigarette case first. Here it is. Now produce your explanation, and pray make it improbable. My dear fellow, there's nothing improbable about my explanation at all. In fact, it's perfectly ordinary. Old Mr. Thomas Cardew, who adopted me when I was a little boy, made me in his will guardian to his granddaughter, Miss Cecily Cardew. Cecily, who addresses me as her uncle out of motives of respect you could not possibly appreciate, <laughs> lives at my place in the country, under the charge of her admirable governess, Miss Prism. Where is that place in the country, by the way? That is nothing to you, dear boy. You are not going to be invited. <laughs> I may tell you candidly that the place is not in Shropshire. I suspected that, my dear fellow. I have bunburied all over Shropshire myself on two separate occasions. Now go on. Tell me why you were Ernest in town and Jack in the country. My dear Algier, I don't know whether you will be able to understand my real motives. <laughs> You're hardly serious enough. When 
one is placed at the position of guardian, one has to adopt a very high moral tone on all subjects. It is one's duty to do so. And as a high moral tone can hardly be said to conduce very much to either one's health or one's happiness, in order to get up to town, I have always pretended to have a younger brother of the name of Ernest, who lives at the Albany and gets into the most dreadful scrapes. And that, my dear Algie, is the whole truth, pure and simple. The truth is rarely pure and never simple. Modern life would be very tedious if it were either. Modern literature, a complete impossibility. That wouldn't be at all a bad thing. Literary criticism is not your forte. Don't try it. Much better leave it to the people who haven't been at university. They do it so well in the daily papers. No, what you really are is a Bunburyist. It's quite right in saying you're a Bunburyist. You are one of the most advanced Bunburyists I know. Oh, what on earth do you mean? You have invented a very useful younger brother for yourself by the name of Ernest, in order that you may be able to come up to town whenever you decide. I have invented an invaluable permanent invalid by the name of Bunbury, in order that I may be able to go down into the country whenever I choose. <laughs> Bunbury is perfectly invaluable. If it wasn't for Bunbury's extraordinary bad health, for instance, I wouldn't be able to dine with you tonight at Willis's. I've really been engaged to Aunt Augusta for more than a week. I haven't asked you to dine with me anywhere tonight. I know. Oh. You're absurdly careless about sending out invitations. It's very foolish of you. Nothing annoys people more than not receiving invitations. You'd much better dine with your Aunt Augusta. <laughs> My dear fellow, I haven't got the slightest intention of doing anything of the kind. To begin with, I dine there on Monday, and once a week is quite enough with one's own relatives. And in the second place, whenever I do dine there, I am treated as a member of the family and sent down with either two women or none at all. Mm. And in the third place, I know perfectly well whom she will place me next to. She will place me next to Mary Farquhar, <laughs> who always flirts with her own husband across the dinner table. That is not very pleasant. Indeed, it is not even decent. <laughs> and that sort of thing is immensely on the increase. The number of married women in London who flirt with their own husbands is perfectly scandalous. Looks so bad. Simply washing one's clean linen in public. <laughs> <laughs> no, now that I know you to be a Bunburyist, I naturally want to talk to you about Bunbury. I want to tell you the rules. I'm not a Bunburyist at all. If Gwendolyn accepts me, I'm going to kill my brother. Indeed, I, I think I'll kill him in any case. <laughs> Cecily's a little too much interested in him. It is rather a bore. So I'm going to get rid of Ernest, and I strongly advise you to do the same with your Mr... <coughs> with, well, with your intimate friend, who has the absurd name. Nothing will ever induce me to part with Bunbury, and if ever you get married, which seems greatly problematic, <coughs> you will be very glad to know Bunbury. A man who marries without knowing Bunbury has a very tedious time of it. Oh, that is nonsense. If I marry a charming girl like Gwendolyn, and she is the only girl I ever saw in my life who I would marry, I certainly won't want to know Bunbury. Then your wife will. You don't seem to realise that in married life, three is company and two is none. That, my dear young friend, is the theory that the corrupt French drama have been propounding for the last 50 years. Yes, and that the happy English home has proved in half the time. For heaven's sake, don't try to be cynical. It's perfectly easy to be cynical. My dear fellow, it isn't easy to be anything nowadays. There's such a lot of beastly competition about. Ah, oh, that'll be Aunt Augusta. Only relatives or creditors ever ring in that bar near in a manner. <laughs> now, if I get her out of the way for ten minutes so that you can propose to Gwendolyn, may I dine with you tonight at Willis's? Oh. Yes, yes, I suppose so, if you want to. Oh, good, but you must be serious about it. I hate people who aren't serious about meals. It's so shallow of them. Lady Bracknell and Miss Fairfax. Good afternoon, dear Algernon. I hope you are behaving very well. I'm feeling very well, Aunt Augusta. Well, that's not quite the same thing. In fact, the two things really go together. Good afternoon, Mr. Worthing. Dear me, you are smart. I am always smart. Am I not, Mr. Worthing? You are quite perfect, Miss Fairfax. Oh, I hope I'm not that. It would leave no room for developments. And I intend to develop in many directions. I'm sorry if we are a little late, Algernon, but I was obliged to call on dear Lady Harbury. 
I haven't been there since her poor husband's death. I never saw a woman so altered. She looks quite 20 years younger. <laughs> and now I'll have a cup of tea and one of those nice cucumber sandwiches you promised me. Certainly, Aunt Augusta. Won't you come and sit here, Gwendolyn? Thanks, Mama. I'm quite comfortable where I am. Good heavens, Lane. Why are there no cucumber sandwiches? Handed them specially. There were no cucumbers in the market this morning, sir. I went down twice. No cucumbers? No, sir. Not even for ready money. <laughs> Thank you, Lane. That will do. Thank you, sir. I am greatly distressed, Aunt Augusta, about there being no cucumbers. Not even for ready money. Oh, it really makes no matter, Algernon. I had some crumpets with Lady Harbury, who seems to me to be living entirely for pleasure now. I hear her hair has turned quite gold from grief. It certainly has changed its colour. From what cause, I, of course, cannot say. Thank you. I've quite a treat for you tonight, Algernon. I'm going to send you down with Mary Farquhar. That's <laughs> such a nice woman and so attentive to her husband. It's delightful to watch them. I'm afraid, Aunt Augusta, I'm going to have to give up the pleasure of dining with you tonight, after all. Oh, I hope not, Algernon. It will put my table completely out. Your poor uncle would have to dine upstairs. Unfortunately, <laughs> <laughs> he is accustomed to that. It is a great bore, and I need hardly say a terrible disappointment. But I've just received a telegram from my poor invalid friend Bunbury to say that he's very ill. They seem to think I should be with him. It is very strange. This Mr. Bunbury seems to suffer from curiously bad health. Yes. Poor Bunbury's a terrible invalid. Well, I must say, Algernon, that I think it is high, high time that Mr. Bunbury made up his mind whether he was going to live or to die. The shilly shallying, but well, the question is absurd. <laughs> Nor do I in any way approve of the modern sympathy with invalids. I consider it morbid. Illness of any kind is hardly a thing to be encouraged in others. Health is the primary duty of life. I'm always telling that to your poor uncle. Not that he seems to take much notice as far as any improvement in his ailment goes. <laughs> I would be much obliged if you would ask Mr. Bunbury from me to be kind enough not to have a relapse on Saturday. <laughs> for I rely on you to arrange my music for me. It is my last reception, and one wants something that will encourage conversation, particularly at the end of the season when everyone has practically said everything they had to say, which in most cases was probably not much. <laughs> I'll speak to uh, Bunbury, Aunt Augusta, if he's still conscious. Oh. And I think I can promise you he'll be quite all right by next Saturday. Of course, the music's a bit of a problem. You see, if you play good music, people don't listen. And if you play bad music, then people don't talk. But I'll run over the programme that I've drawn up. If you'll be kind enough to come into the next room with me. Thank you, Algernon. It is very thoughtful of you. I'm sure the programme will be delightful after a few expurgations. French songs I cannot possibly allow. People either think they are improper and look shocked, which is vulgar, or not, which is worse. But German sounds a thoroughly respectable language, and indeed I believe is so. Gwendolyn, you will accompany me. Oh, yes, certainly, Mama. Charming day it has been, uh, Miss Fairfax. <laughs> Pray don't talk to me about the weather, Mr. Worthing. Whenever people talk to me about the weather, I always feel quite certain they mean something else. And that makes me so nervous. I do mean something else. I thought so. In fact, I'm never wrong. And I would like to be allowed to take advantage of Lady Bracknell's uh, temporary absence. I would certainly advise you to do so. And Mama has a way of coming back suddenly into a room that I have often had to speak to her about. Miss Fairfax, ever since I met you, I've admired you more than any girl I have ever met since I met you. <laughs> yes, Mr. Worthing, I'm well aware of the fact, and I often wish that in public at any rate you'd been more demonstrative. For me, you have always had an irresistible fascination. Even before I met you, I was far from indifferent to you. Oh, we live, as I hope you know, Mr. Worthing, in an age of ideals that, in fact, is constantly mentioned in the more expensive monthly magazines and has reached the provincial pulpits, I am told. And my ideal has always been to love someone of the name of Ernest. 
There is something in that name which inspires absolute confidence. The moment Algernon first told me he had a friend named Ernest, I knew I was destined to love you. You really love me, Gwendolyn? Passionately. Oh, darling, you don't know how happy you've made me. My own eye. <coughs> but you, you don't really mean to say that you couldn't love me if my name wasn't Ernest. <laughs> uh, your name is Ernest? Yes, I, I know it is. <laughs> Supposing it was something else. <laughs> Do you mean to say you couldn't love me then? That is clearly a metaphysical speculation. And like most metaphysical speculations, has very little reference to the actual facts of real life as we know them today. <laughs> Personally, darling, to, to speak quite candidly, I don't much care about the name of Ernest. I don't think the name suits me at all. Oh, it suits you perfectly. It's a divine name. It has a music of its own. It produces... Vibrations. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> I, I must say, I, I think there are lots of other much nicer names. I think... Jack. <laughs> Darling name. Jack. No, there is very little music in the name of Jack, if any at all indeed, but it does not thrill. It produces absolutely no vibrations. I have known several Jacks, and they all, without exception, were more than usually plain. Besides, Jack is a notorious domesticity for John. And I pity any woman who is married to a man named John. She may never be allowed to know the entrancing pleasure of a single moment's solitude. The only really safe name is Ernest. Gwendolyn, I must get christened at once. <laughs> I mean, we must get married at once. There is no time to be lost. Married, Mr. Worthing. Well, you surely know that, that I love you. And you led me to believe, Miss Fairfax, that you are not absolutely indifferent to me. I adore you. But you haven't proposed to me yet. Nothing has been said about marriage. The subject hasn't even been touched on. Well, may I propose to you now? I think it would be an admirable opportunity. And to save you any possible disappointment, I think it only fair to tell you quite frankly beforehand that I'm fully determined to accept you. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yes, Mr. Worthing. <coughs> You know what I've got to say to you. Yes, but you don't say it. <laughs> Gwendolyn, will you marry me? Of course I will, darling. How long you've been about it. I'm afraid you've had very little experience in how to propose. My own one, I've never loved anyone in the world but you. Yes, but men often propose for practice. <laughs> oh, I know my brother Gerald does, all my girlfriends tell me. <laughs> Wonderfully blue eyes you have, Ernest. They're quite, quite blue. I hope you'll always look at me just like that, especially when there are other people present. <laughs> Mr. Worthing, rise up from this semi recumbent posture. It is not in No, I must beg you to retire. This is no place for you. Besides, Mr. Worthing has not quite finished yet. Finished what, may I ask? <laughs> I'm engaged to be married to Mr. Worthing, Mama. Pardon me, you are not engaged to anyone. When you do become engaged to someone, I or your father, should his health permit him, will inform you of the fact. <laughs> An engagement should come on a young girl as a surprise. Pleasant or unpleasant as the case may be. It's scarcely a matter she should be allowed to arrange for herself. And now I have a few questions to put to you, Mr. Worthing. While I am making these inquiries, you, Gwendolyn, will wait for me below in the carriage. Ma! In the carriage, Gwendolyn. Gwendolyn! The carriage! Mm. Yes, Mama. You may take a seat, Mr. Worthing. Thank you, Lady Brackle. I prefer standing. <laughs> <laughs> 
I feel bound to tell you that you are not down on my list of eligible young men. Although I have the same list as the dear Duchess of Bolton has, we work together, in fact. <laughs> However, I am quite ready to enter your name, should your answers be what a really affectionate mother requires. Do you smoke? Well, yes, I, I must admit I smoke. I am glad to hear it. A man should always have an occupation of some kind. There are too many idle men in London as it is. How old are you? Twenty-nine. A very good age to be married at. I have always been of opinion that a man who desires to get married should know either everything or nothing. Which do you know? I know... Nothing. I am pleased to hear it. <laughs> I do not approve of anything that tampers with natural ignorance. <laughs> ignorance is like a delicate, exotic fruit. Touch it and the bloom is gone. The whole theory of modern education is radically unsound. Fortunately, in England, at any rate, education produces no effect whatsoever. <laughs> if it did, it would prove a serious danger to the upper classes and probably lead to acts of violence in Grosvenor Square. <laughs> what is your income? Between seven and eight thousand a year. In land or in investments? In investments, chiefly. That is satisfactory. What between the duties expected of one during one's lifetime and the duties exacted of one after one's death, land has ceased to be a profit or a pleasure. It gives one position and prevents one from keeping it up. And that's all that can be said about that. I have a country house with some land, of course, attached to it. About 1,500 acres, I believe. But I don't depend on that for my real income. In fact, as far as I can make out, the poachers are the only people to make anything out of it. <laughs> a, a tree house? How many bedrooms? Oh, well, that point could be cleared up afterwards. <laughs> you have a townhouse, I hope. A girl with a simple, unspoiled nature like Gwendolyn could hardly be expected to reside in the country. I own a house in Belgrave Square, but it is let by the year to Lady Bloxham. Of course, I can get it back whenever I wish, at six months' notice. Lady Bloxham? I don't know her. Oh, she goes about very little. She's a lady considerably advanced in years. Ah, nowadays that is no guarantee of respectability of character. <laughs> what number in Belgrave Square? 149. The unfashionable sound. <laughs> I thought there was something. However, that could easily be altered. Do you mean the fashion or the side? Both, if necessary, I presume. <laughs> what are your politics? Well, I'm afraid I really have none. I'm a liberal unionist. Oh, they count as Tories. <laughs> they dine with us, or come in in the evening at any rate. Now, to minor matters. <coughs> are your parents living? I have lost both my parents. To lose one parent. Well, maybe the garden is a misfortune. To lose both looks like carelessness. <laughs> Who was your father? He was evidently a man of some wealth. Was he born into what the radical papers call the purple of commerce, or did he rise from the ranks of the aristocracy? Well, I'm, I'm afraid I really don't know. The fact is, Lady Bracknell, I said I had lost my parents. It would be <coughs> the truth to say my parents seem to have lost me. I don't actually know who I am by birth. I was... Well, I was found. Found? The late Mr. Thomas Cardew, an old gentleman of a very charitable and kindly disposition, found me. And gave me the name of Worthing because he happened to have a, a first-class ticket for Worthing in his pocket at the time. <laughs> Worthing is a place in Sussex. It is a seaside resort. Where did this charitable gentleman who had this first-class ticket for this seaside resort find you? In a handbag. <laughs> a handbag? <laughs> yes, Lady Bracknell. I was in a handbag. A somewhat large, black, leather handbag. With handles to it. An ordinary handbag, in fact. In what locality did this Mr. James or Thomas Card you come across this ordinary handbag? In the cloakroom at Victoria Station. It was given him in mistake for his own. The cloakroom at Victoria Station? <laughs> yes, the Brighton line. Which the handbag was found. The cloak 
Liverpool at a railway station might serve to conceal a social indiscretion. <laughs> as probably indeed be used for that purpose before now. But it could hardly be regarded as an assured basis for a recognized position in good society. May I ask you then what you'd advise me to do? I need hardly say that I, I would do anything in the world to ensure Gwendolen's happiness. I would strongly advise you, Mr. Worthing, to try and acquire some relations as soon as possible. Yeah. And to make a definite effort to produce at any rate one parent of either sex before the season is quite over. Yeah. Well, I don't really see how I can possibly manage to do that. I can produce the handbag at any moment. <laughs> <laughs> it's in my dressing room at home. I really think that should satisfy you, Lady Bracken. Please? What has it to do with me? Well, you can hardly imagine that I and Lord Bracknell would dream of allowing our only daughter, a girl brought up with the utmost care, to marry into a cloakroom and form an alliance with a parcel. <laughs> Good morning, Mr. Worthing. <laughs> Good morning. chance of Gwendolyn becoming like a mother in about 150 years, do you, Archie? <laughs> All women become like their mothers. That is their tragedy. No man ever does. That's his. Is that clever? It is perfectly phrased and quite as true an observation in civilised life as any should be. I'm sick to death of cleverness. Everybody's clever nowadays. You can't go anywhere without meeting clever people. The things become an absolute public nuisance. I wish to goodness we had a few fools left. We have. I should extremely like to meet them. What do they talk about? The fools? Why, the clever people, of course. What fools? Have you told Gwendolyn the truth about your being Ernest in town and Jack in the country? My dear fellow, the truth isn't quite the sort of thing one tells a nice, sweet, refined girl. Extraordinary ideas you have about the way to behave to a woman. The only way to behave to a woman is to make love to her if she is pretty and to someone else if she's plain. <laughs> <laughs> that is nonsense. How about your brother? How about the profligate Ernest? Oh, before the end of the week, I shall have got rid of him. I shall say he died in Paris of apoplexy. Lots of pe people die of apoplexy quite suddenly, don't they? Yes, but it's hereditary, my dear fellow. It's a sort of thing that runs in families. With much better say, a severe chill. You're quite sure a severe chill isn't hereditary or anything of that kind? Of course it is. <laughs> Very well then. My poor brother Ernest is suddenly carried off in Paris, suddenly by a severe chill. That gets rid of him. Yes, but I thought you said that Miss Cardew was a little over-fond of your poor younger brother. Won't she feel his loss a great deal? That is all right. Cecily is not a silly romantic girl, I'm glad to say. Now, she has a capital appetite, goes for long walks and pays no attention at all to her lessons. I would rather like to see you, Cecily. I shall take very good care, you never do. She's excessively pretty and she's only just 18. Have you told Gwendolyn the truth about your having excessively pretty ward who's just turned 18? One doesn't just blurt these things out to people. Cecily and Gwendolyn are perfectly certain to be extremely great friends. I bet you anything you like, half an hour after they've met, they'll be calling each other sister. Women only do that after they've called each other a lot of other names. <laughs> <laughs> now, we really want to get a good table at Willis's. We'd better go and dress. I'm hungry. I never knew you when you weren't. What do we do after dinner? Go to a theatre? Oh, no, I love looking. Well, we might go to a club. 
No, I hate talking. Well, shall we trot round to the Empire at ten? No, I, I can't bear looking at things. It's, it's so silly. Well, what shall we do then? Nothing. It's awfully hard work doing nothing. <laughs> Still, I don't mind hard work when there's no definite object of any kind. Miss Fairfax. Gwendolyn, upon my word. Algy, kindly turn your back. I have something very particular to say to Mr. Worthy. Gwendolyn, I'm really not sure I can allow, allow this. Algy, you always adopt a strictly immoral attitude towards life. You're not quite old enough to do that. My own darling. Honest. We may never be married. From the expression on Mama's face, I fear we never shall. Few parents nowadays pay any regard to what their children have to say to them. The old-fashioned respect for the young is fast dying out. Whatever influence I ever had over Mama, I lost at the age of three. <laughs> but although she may prevent us from becoming man and wife, and I may marry someone else, marry often, nothing she can ever do will alter my eternal devotion to you. Dear Gwendolyn. The story of your romantic origin, as related to me by Mama with unpleasing comments, has naturally stirred the deeper fibres of my nature. Your Christian name has an irresistible fascination, and the simplicity of your character is exquisitely incomprehensible to me. Are your town address at the Albany I have? What is your address in the country? The Manor House. Walton. There is a good postal service, I suppose. It may be necessary to do something desperate. That, of course, will require serious consideration. I will communicate with you daily. I don't How long do you remain in town? Till Monday. Good. Algy, you may turn around now. Thank you. I've turned around already. <laughs> you may also <laughs> ring the bell. You will let me see you to your carriage, my own darling. Certainly. I will see Miss Fairfax out. Yes,
see, surely such a utilitarian occupation as the watering of flowers is rather Morton's duty than yours, especially at a moment when intellectual pleasures await you. Your German grammar is on the table. Pray open it at page 15. We will repeat yesterday's lesson. I don't like German. It isn't at all a becoming language. I know perfectly well I look quite plain after my German lesson. Child, you know how anxious your guardian is that you should improve yourself in every way. He laid particular stress on your German as he was leaving for town yesterday. Indeed, he always lays stress on your German when he is leaving for town. Dear Uncle Jack is so very serious. Sometimes he is so serious I think he cannot be quite well. Your guardian enjoys the best of health and his gravity of demeanour is especially to be commended in someone so comparatively young as he is. I know of no one who has a higher sense of duty and responsibility. I suppose that is why he often looks a little bored when we three are together. Cecily, I am surprised at you. Mr. Worthing has many troubles in his life. I don't know very much. Triviality would be quite out of place in his conversation. You must remember his constant anxiety about that unfortunate young man, his brother. I wish Uncle Jack would allow that unfortunate young man, his brother, to come down here sometimes. <laughs> we might have a good influence over him, Miss Prism. I'm sure you certainly would. You know all about German and geology, and things of that sort influence a man very much. I do not think that even I could produce any effect on a character that, according to his own brother's admission, is irretrievably weak and vacillating. Indeed, I'm not sure that I would desire to reclaim him. I am not in favour of this modern mania for turning bad people into good people at a moment's notice. As a man so socially <coughs> rape, <coughs> you must put away your diary, Cecily. I really don't see why you should keep a diary at all. I keep a diary in order to enter all the wonderful secrets of my life. If I didn't write them down, I should probably forget all about them. Memory, my dear Cecily, is the diary we all carry about with us. Yes, but it usually chronicles the things that have never happened, that couldn't possibly have happened. I believe that memory is responsible for nearly all the three-volume novels that Moody sends us. <laughs> Do not speak slightingly of the three-volume novels. I wrote one myself. <laughs> <laughs> Did you really, Miss Prism? How wonderfully clever you are. <laughs> I hope it did not end happily. I don't like novels that end happily. They depress me so much. The good ended happily and the bad unhappily. That is what fiction means. I suppose so. <laughs> it seems very unfair. But was your novel ever published? Alas, no. <laughs> the manuscript, unfortunately, was abandoned. I use the word in the sense of lost or mislaid. To your work, child, these speculations <laughs> are profitless. But I see dear Dr. Chasuble coming up through the garden. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Cobb. <laughs> and a uh, walk might do it good. With pleasure, Miss Prism. With pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> we might go as far as the schools in there. Oh, that would be delightful. Oh, Cecily, in I have <laughs> You will read your political economy, the chapter on the fall of the rupee you may omit. It is somewhat too sensational. <laughs> Even these metallic problems have their melodramatic side. Horrid political economy, horrid geography, horrid, horrid German. <coughs> Mr. Ernest Worthing has just driven over from the station. He has brought his luggage with him. Mr. Ernest Worthing, before the Albany W, Uncle Jack's brother. Did you tell him Mr. Worthing was in town? Yes, miss. He seemed very much disappointed. I mentioned that you and Miss Prism were in the garden. He seemed anxious to speak to you privately for a moment. <coughs> Ask Mr. Ernest Worthing to come here. I suppose you'd better talk to the housekeeper about a room for him. Yes, miss. I've never met any really wicked person before. <laughs> I feel rather frightened. I'm so afraid he will look just like everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> he does. You are my little cousin Cecily, I'm sure. You are under some strange mistake. I am not little. In fact, I believe I'm more than usually tall for my age. And your cousin Cecily. You, I see from your card, are Uncle Jack's brother. My cousin Ernest. My wicked cousin Ernest. Oh, I'm really not wicked at all, cousin Cecily. You mustn't think that I'm wicked. If you are not, then you have certainly been deceiving us all in a most inexcusable manner. I hope you have not been leading a double life, <laughs> pretending to be wicked and being really good all the time. That would be hypocrisy. Oh. Of course, I have been rather reckless. I'm glad to hear it. In fact, now that you mention the subject, I have been very bad in my own small way. I don't think you should be so proud of that, although I'm sure it must have been very pleasant. It is much pleasanter being here with you. I can't understand how you are here at all. Uncle Jack won't be back until Monday afternoon. That is a great disappointment to me. I'm obliged to go up by the first train on Monday. I have a business appointment which I'm anxious to uh, miss. Couldn't you miss it anywhere but in London? No, the appointment is in London. Well, I understand, of course, how important it is not to keep a business engagement if one wants to retain any sense of the beauty of life. <coughs> Still, I think you had better wait till Uncle Jack arrives. I know he wants to talk to you about your emigrating. About my what? <laughs> You're emigrating. He's gone up to buy your outfit. I certainly wouldn't let Jack buy my outfit. <laughs> he has no taste in neckties at all. Oh, I don't think you will require neckties. <coughs> Uncle Jack is sending you to Australia. <laughs> <laughs> Australia? I'd sooner die. <laughs> he said at dinner on Wednesday night that you would have to choose between this world, the next world, and Australia. <laughs> oh. Well, the accounts that I've been hearing of Australia in the next world are not particularly encouraging. This world is good enough for me, Cousin Cecily. Yes. But are you good enough for it? I'm afraid I'm not that. That's why I need you to reform me. You might make that your mission, if you don't mind. I'm afraid I've no time this afternoon. Well, would you mind my reforming myself this afternoon? It is rather quixotic of you, but I think you should try. I will. I feel better already. You're looking a little worse. That's because I'm hungry. How thoughtless of me. I should have remembered that when one is about to lead an entirely new life, one requires regular and wholesome meals. Won't you come in? Thank you. Might I have a buttonhole first? I never have an appetite unless I have a buttonhole first. A maréchal Mia? No, I'd like a pink rose. Why? Because you are like a pink rose, Cousin oh. Cecily. I don't think it can be quite right for you to talk to me like that. Miss Prism never says such things to me. Then, <laughs> then Miss Prism is a short-sighted old lady. You are the 
prettiest girl I ever saw. Miss Prism says all good looks are a snare. They're a snare that every sensible man would like to be caught in. Oh, I don't think I should care to catch a sensible man. I shouldn't know what to talk to him about. <laughs> you are too much alone, dear doctor. You should get married. <laughs> a different frock I can understand, a woman frock never. Believe me, I, I do not deserve so uh, near logistic a phrase. <laughs> The practice and the precept of the primitive church was distinctly against matrimony. That is obviously the reason why the primitive church has not lasted up to the present day. <laughs> and you do not seem to realize, dear doctor, that by persistently remaining single, a man converts himself into a permanent public temptation. Men should be more careful. This very celibacy leads weaker vessels astray. <laughs> But is a man not equal, equally attractive when married? No married man is ever attractive, except to his wife. And often I've been told, not even to her. <laughs> <laughs> that depends on the intellectual sympathies of the woman. Maturity can always be relied upon. Brightness can be trusted. Young women are green. I spoke horticulturally. <laughs> My metaphor was drawn from fruits. But where is Cecily? Uh, uh, perhaps she followed us to the schools. Mr. Worthing! <laughs> Mr. Worthing? Oh, this is indeed a surprise. We did not look for you until Monday afternoon. I have returned sooner than I expected. Dr. Chasuble, I hope you are well. Mr. Worthing, I, I trust this garb of woe does not betoken some terrible calamity. My brother. More shameful deaths and extravagance. Still leading his life of pleasure. Dead. Your, your brother Ernest dead? Quite dead. What a lesson for him! <laughs> Worthing, I offer you my sincere condolences. You have at least the consolation of knowing that you are always the most generous and forgiving of brothers. Poor Ernest. <laughs> he had many faults, but it is a sad, sad love. Very sad indeed. Were you with him at the end? No. He died abroad. In Paris, in fact. I had a telegram last night from the manager of the Grand Hotel. Was the cause of death mentioned? A severe chill. As a man sows, so shall he reap. <laughs> charity, dear Miss Prism, charity. None of us is perfect. I myself am peculiarly susceptible to drafts. <laughs> <laughs> Will the internment take place here? No. <laughs> he seems to have expressed a desire to be buried in Paris. In Paris? that hardly points to any very serious state of mind at the last. <laughs> no doubt you would wish me to make some slight allusion to this tragic domestic affliction next Sunday. My sermon on the meaning of the manor in the wilderness can be adapted to almost any occasion. <laughs> Joyful, or as in this present case, distressing. I preached it at harvest celebrations, christenings, confirmations, on days of humiliation, and on festival days. The, the last time I delivered it was in the cathedral as a uh, charity sermon on behalf of the Society for the Prevention of Discontent among the Upper Orders. <laughs> the bishop who was present was much struck by some of the analogies I drew. Oh, that reminds me. You mentioned christenings, I think, Dr. Chasuble. I suppose you know how to christen all right. <laughs> I mean, of course, you're continually christening, aren't you? It is, I regret to say, one of the rector's most constant duties in this parish. I have often spoken to the poorer classes on the subject, but they don't seem to know what the drift is. <laughs> but um, have you a particular infant in mind, Mr. Worthy, your brother? Was, I believe, unmarried, was he not? Oh, yes, quite unmarried. People who live entirely for pleasure usually are. <laughs> but it is not for any child, dear Doctor. I'm very fond of children. No, the fact is, I like christened myself. This afternoon, if you've nothing better. <laughs> Surely, Mr. Worthing, you have been christened already. <laughs> I don't remember anything about it. Of course, I don't know whether it would disturb you at all, or, or if you think I'm a little too old now. No, 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 
not at all. The, the, the sprinkling and indeed the immersion of adults is a perfectly canonical practice. Immersion? <laughs> you need to have no apprehensions, Mr. Worthing. Sprinkling is all that is necessary. <laughs> or indeed, desirable. Our, our weather is so changeable. A <laughs> 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 jar would you wish the ceremony performed? I might trot around about five, if that would suit you. Uh, perfect, perfect. <coughs> In fact, I have two similar ceremonies to perform at that hour. A case of twins that occurred recently in one of the outlying cottages on your own estate. Well, Jenkins the Carter, the most hard-working man. Oh, I don't see much fun in being christened along with other babies. <laughs> I mean, that would be childish. <laughs> would half past five do? No, admirably, admirably. And now, dear Mr. Worthing, I will not intrude in a house of sorrow any longer. <laughs> I merely beg you not to be too much bowed down by grief. What seem to us bitter trials are often blessings in disguise. This seems to me to be a blessing of an extremely obvious kind. <laughs> Uncle Jack! Oh, I am pleased to see you back. What horrid clothes you've got on. Do go and change them. My child, my child. Uncle oh, Jack, what's the matter? Do look happy. You look as if you had a toothache. And I have got such a surprise for you. <laughs> Who do you think is in the dining room? Oh. Your brother! Who? <laughs> Your brother Ernest. He arrived about half an hour ago. What nonsense! I have got a brother! Don't say that. No matter how badly he may have behaved to you in the past, he is still your brother. You couldn't be so heartless as to disown him. I'll go and tell him to come out. And you will shake hands with him, won't you, Uncle Jack? <laughs> He's a very joyful tidy. <laughs> After we had all been resigned to his loss, his sudden return seems peculiarly distressing. <laughs> My brother is in the dining room. I don't know what it all means. I think it is perfectly absurd. Oh, good heavens! <laughs> My dear brother John, I've come down from town to say that I'm very sorry for all the trouble that I've caused you and that I intend to lead a better life in future. Uncle Jack, you are not going to refuse your own brother's hand. Nothing will induce me to take his hand. I think he's coming down here disgraceful. He knows perfectly well why. Uncle Jack, do be nice. There is some good in everyone. Ernest has just been telling me about his poor invalid friend, Mr. Bungle. <laughs> Surely there must be much good from one, one who is kind to an invalid and leaves the pleasures of London to sit by a bed of pain. Oh, he's been talking about Bunbury, has he? Yes. He told me all about poor Mr. Bunbury and his terrible state of health. Bunbury? Well, I won't have him talk to you about Bunbury or about anything else. I'm not going to try one. Perfectly frantic. Of course. I admit the faults were entirely my own, but I must say that I find Brother John's coldness peculiarly painful, particularly as it's the first time I've come down here. Uncle Jack, if you don't shake hands with Ernest, I will never forgive you. Never forgive me? Never, never, never. Well, this is the last time I shall ever do it. <laughs> It is pleasant, is it not, to see so perfect a reconciliation? <laughs> I think we might leave the two brothers together. You will come with us, Cecily. Certainly, Miss Prism. My little task of reconciliation is over. You've done a beautiful action today, dear child. We must not be premature in our judgments. You're very happy. <laughs> you jump scoundrel, Algy. You must get out of this place as soon as possible. I don't allow any bunbring here. I've put Mr. Ernest's things in the room next to yours, sir. I suppose that is all right. What? Mr. Ernest's luggage, sir. I have unpacked it and put it in the room next to your own. His luggage? <laughs> yes, sir. Three portmanteaus, a dressing case, two hat boxes, and a large luncheon basket. I'm afraid I can't stay more than a week this time. <laughs> Very well. Order the dog cart at once. Mr. Ernest has been suddenly called back to town. Yes, sir. What a fearful liar you are, Jack. I haven't been called back to town at all. Yes, you have. I haven't heard anyone call me. Your duty as a gentleman calls you back. My duty as a gentleman has never interfered with my pleasures in the smallest degree. I quite understand that. Well, 
Cecily is a darling. You are not the talk of Miss Codger like that. I don't like it. I don't like your clothes. You look perfectly ridiculous in them. It's perfect. Why don't you go up and change? It's perfectly childish to be dressed in deep mourning for someone who's actually staying as a guest in your house. <laughs> <laughs> I call it grotesque. You're certainly not staying with me for a whole week as a guest or, or anything else. You've got to leave by the 4-5 train. You certainly shan't leave while you're dressed in mourning. It would be very unfriendly of me. If I were dressed in mourning, you would wait with me, I suppose. I would think it very unfriendly if you didn't. But will you go if I change my clothes? Certainly, if you don't take too long to change. I never saw anybody take so long to dress into such little effect. <laughs> well, at any rate, that is better than being always overdressed, as you are. If I am occasionally a little overdressed, I make up for it by being always immensely overeducated. <laughs> your vanity is ridiculous, your colour is outrage, and your presence in my garden utterly absurd. You have to catch the 4-5. And I hope you will have a pleasant journey back to town. This bunbury, as you call it, has not been a great success for you. I think it has been a great success. I am in love with Cecily, and that is everything. <laughs> but I must make arrangements with her for another bunbury before I go. Ah! There she is! Oh! I merely came back to water the roses. I thought you were with Uncle Jack. He's gone to order the dog cart for me. Oh, is he going to take you for a nice drive? <laughs> He's sending me away. Then have we got to part? I'm afraid so. It's a very painful party. It is always painful to part from people whom one has known for a very brief space of time. The absence of old friends one can endure with equanimity. But even a momentary separation from anyone to whom one has just been introduced is almost Unbearable. Thank you. The dog cart is at the door, sir. It can wait, Merriman, for five minutes. Yes, miss. Mm. <coughs> I hope, Cecily, I shall not offend you if I state quite openly and frankly that you seem to me to be in every way the absolute personification of visible perfection. <laughs> I think your frankness does you great credit, Ernest. <laughs> if you will allow me, I will copy your remarks into my diary. Do you really keep a diary? I'd give anything to have a look at it. May I? Oh, no. You see, it is simply a very young girl's records of her own thoughts and impressions, and consequently meant for publication. When it appears in volume form, I hope you will order a copy. But pray, Ernest, don't stop. I delight in taking down from dictation. I have reached absolute perfection. You can go on. I'm quite ready for more. <coughs> Don't cough, Ernest. When one is dictating, one should speak fluently and not cough. Besides, I don't know how to spell a cough. <laughs> My dearest Cecily, ever since I first dared to gaze upon your wonderful and incomparable beauty, I have dared to love you wildly, passionately, devotedly, hopelessly. I don't think you should tell me that you love me wildly, passionately, devotedly, hopelessly. Hopelessly doesn't make much sense, does it? Cecily. The dog cart is waiting, sir. Oh, <laughs> tell it to come round next week at the same hour. <laughs> Yes, sir. <laughs> Uncle Jack would be very much annoyed if he knew you were staying till next week at the same hour. Well, I don't care about Uncle Jack. I don't care about anybody apart from you. I love you, Cecily. You will marry me, won't you? Of course, you silly boy. Why, we have been engaged for the last three months. <laughs> for the last three months? It will be exactly three months on Thursday. But how did we get engaged? Well, ever since dear Uncle Jack first told us that he had a brother who was very wicked and bad, you, of course, have formed the chief topic of conversation between Miss Prism and myself. And, of course, any man who is much talked about is always very attractive. One feels there must be something in him after all. I dare say it was foolish of me. But I fell in love with you, Ernest. Darling. 
And was the engagement actually settled? On the 22nd of April last, worn out by your entire ignorance of my existence, I determined to end the matter one way or the other. After a long struggle with myself, I accepted you under this dear old tree here. The next day, I brought this ring in your name. And this is the little bangle with the true lover's knot I promised you always to wear. Did I give you this? <laughs> Very pretty, isn't it? Yes. You've wonderfully good taste, Ernest. It's the excuse I've always given for your leading such a bad life. And this is the box in which I keep all your dear letters. My letters? <laughs> but, my dear sweet Cecily, I never wrote to you any letters. You need hardly remind me of that, Ernest. I remember only too well that I was forced to write your letters for you. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote always three times a week and sometimes oftener. Oh, do let me read them, Cecily. I couldn't possibly. They would make you far too conceited. Mm. The three you wrote me after I broke off our engagement are so beautiful and so badly spelled. But Even now I can hardly read them without crying a little. But was our engagement ever broken off? Of course it was. On May the 14th last. See the entry if you like. Today I broke <coughs> off my engagement with Ernest. I feel it is better to do so. The weather still continues charming. <laughs> Why was it broken off? What had I done? I've done absolutely nothing at all. Darling, I'm very hurt indeed to hear you broke it off, particularly when the weather was so charming. It hardly would be a really serious engagement if it hadn't been broken off at least once. Besides, I forgave you before the week was out. What a perfect angel you are. My dear romantic boy, I hope your hair curls naturally. Does it? Oh, yes, <laughs> with a little help from others. I'm so glad. <laughs> Darling. You won't ever break off our engagement again, will you? I think I could. Not now that I've actually met you. <laughs> besides, of course, there's always the question of your name. Yes, of course. You must not laugh at me, Ernest. But it has always been a girlish dream of mine to love someone whose name was Ernest. There is something in that name that seems to inspire absolute confidence. I pity any poor married woman whose husband is not called Ernest. Oh, my dear sweet Cecily, you don't mean to say that you, you <coughs> couldn't love me if I had some other name. But what other name? Oh, any other name, like, um, Algernon, for instance. <laughs> don't like the name of Algernon. Oh, but my own sweet, loving little darling. It's really not such a bad name. In fact, it's a rather aristocratic name. More, more than half the chaps who get into the bankruptcy court are called Algy. <laughs> but really, darling, if I was called Algernon, do you mean to say you couldn't love me? I might respect you. I might admire your character. But I feel I would not be able to give you my undivided attention. Cecily, your rector here is thoroughly experienced in the rites and practices of the church. Oh, yes. Dr. Chasuble is the most learned man. He has never written a single book, so you can imagine how much he knows. I must, I must see him at once about the most important christening. I need on important business. Oh. I shan't be more than half an hour. Considering that we've been engaged since April the 22nd, and that I met you today for only the first time, I think it is a little hard that you should leave me for so long a period as half an hour. Couldn't you make it 20 <coughs> minutes? I'll be back in no time. What an impetuous boy he is. Oh, I like his hair so much. <laughs> I must enter his proposal in my diary. <clears throat> uh, Miss Fairfax has just called to see Mr. Worthing. On very important <clears throat> business, Miss Fairfax states. Isn't Mr. Worthing in his library? Mr. Worthing went over in the direction of the rectory some time ago. Pray ask the lady to come out here. He's bound to be back soon, and you can serve tea. Yes, miss. Miss Fairfax. Probably one of the many good elderly women who are associated with Uncle Jack in some of his philanthropic work in London. I don't quite like women who are interested in philanthropic work. 
It is a board of them. Miss Fairfax. Pray, allow me to introduce myself to you. My name is Cecily Cardew. Cecily Cardew. What a very sweet name. Something tells me we're going to be great friends. I like you already, more than I can say. My first impressions of people are never wrong. How nice of you to like me so much after we've known each other such a comparatively short time. Pray, sit down. I may call you Cecily, may I not? With pleasure. And you will always call me Gwendolyn, won't you? If you wish. Then that is all quite settled, is it not? I hope so. Uh, perhaps this might be a favourable opportunity for my mentioning who I am. My father is Lord Bracknell. You've never heard of Papa, I suppose. I don't think so. Outside the family circle, Papa, I'm glad to say, is entirely unknown. I think that's quite as it should be. The whole seems to me to be the proper sphere for the man. And certainly, once a man begins to neglect his domestic duties, he becomes painfully effeminate. And I don't like that. Makes men so very attractive. Uh, <laughs> Cecily. <laughs> Mama, whose views on education are remarkably strict, has brought me up to be extremely short sighted. It's part of her system. So, would you mind my looking at you through my glasses? Not at all, Gwendolyn. I'm very fond of being looked at. Uh, you're here on a short visit, I suppose? Oh, no. I live here. Mm. Really? Are your mother or some other female relative of advanced years resides here also? Oh, no, I have no mother, nor in fact any relations. Indeed. My dear guardian, with the assistance of Miss Prism, has the arduous task of looking after me. <coughs> your guardian? Yes. I am Mr. Worthing's ward. <coughs> oh. How very strange. He never mentioned to me he had a ward. How very secretive of him. It grows more interesting hourly. I'm not sure, however, that the news inspires me with feelings of unmixed delight. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm very fond of you, Cecily. I've liked you ever since I met you. But I'm bound to stay. <coughs> now I know you're Mr. Worthing's ward. I can't help expressing a wish that you are, uh, well, just a little older than you seem to be and not quite so very alluring in appearance. In fact, if I may speak quite candidly. Pray do. I feel that whenever one has anything unpleasant to say, one should always be quite candid. <laughs> well, to speak with perfect candor, Cecily, I wish you were fully 42 and... <laughs> 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 Ernest has a strong, upright nature. He is the very soul of truth and honor. But disloyalty to him would be as impossible as deception. Even men of the noblest possible moral character are extremely susceptible to the physical charms of others. Mm. Modern, a less than ancient history, provides us with many painful examples of what I refer to. If it were not so, indeed, history would be quite unreadable. <laughs> I beg your pardon, Gwendolyn, but did you say Ernest? Yes. Oh, but it is not Mr. <gasps> Ernest Worthing who is my guardian. <gasps> it is his brother, his elder brother. He never mentioned to me he had a brother. I'm sorry to say they've not been on good terms for some time. Ah, oh, that accounts for it. But now I think of it, I've never heard any man mention his brother. The subject seems distasteful to most men. <laughs> Cecily, you've lifted a load from my mind. I was growing almost anxious. And it would be terrible if Cloud was to come across a friendship like ours, would it not? Of course, you are quite, quite sure it is not Mr. Ernest Worthing with your guardian. Quite sure. In fact, I am going to be his. I beg your pardon. <laughs> Dear Miss Gwendolyn, there is no reason why I should make a secret of it to you. Our little county newspaper is sure to chronicle the fact next week. Mr. Ernest Worthing and I are engaged to be married. <laughs> oh, my darling Cecily, I feel there must be some slight error. Mr. Worthing is engaged to me. The announcement will appear in the morning post on Saturday at the latest. I think you must be under some misconception. Ernest proposed to me exactly ten minutes ago. 
<laughs> well, it was certainly very curious. Well, he asked me to be his wife yesterday afternoon at 5.30. If you would care to verify the incident, pray do so. <laughs> <laughs> I never travel without my diary. One should always have something sensational to read on the train. <laughs> I'm so sorry, my darling Cecily, if it comes as any disappointment to you. But I'm afraid that I have the prior claim. It would distress me more than I could tell you, dearest Gwendolyn, if it should cause you any mental or physical anguish. But I feel bound to point out that since Ernest proposed to you, he's clearly changed his mind. <laughs> if the poor fellow has been entrapped into any foolish promise, I will consider it my duty to rescue him at once, and with a firm hand. Whatever unfortunate entanglement my poor boy may have got himself into, I will never reproach him with it after we are married. Do you allude to me, Miss Cardew, as an entanglement? You are presumptuous. On an occasion of this kind, it becomes more than a moral duty to speak one's mind. It becomes a pleasure. <laughs> Did you suggest, Miss Fairfax, that I entrapped Ernest into an engagement? How dare you? This is no time for wearing the shallow mask of manners. When I see a spade, I call it a spade. I am glad to say I have never seen a spade. <laughs> <laughs> it is obvious our social spheres have been widely different. <laughs> Shall I lay tea here as usual, Miss? Yes. As usual. <laughs> Are there many interesting walks in the vicinity, Miss Cardew? Oh, yes, a great many. From the top of one of the hills nearby, one can see five counties. Five counties? I don't think I should like that. I hate crap. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I suppose that is why you live in town. Well, quite a well-kept garden this is, Miss Cardew. So glad you like it, Miss Fairfax. I had no idea there were any flowers in the country. Oh, yes. Flowers are as common here, Miss Fairfax. As people are in London. <laughs> Personally, I can't understand how anybody manages to exist in the country. If anybody who is anybody does, the country always bores me to death. Oh, this is what the newspapers call agricultural depression, is it not? I hear the aristocracy are suffering very much from it at present. Oh, is it any epidemic amongst them, I have been told? May I offer you tea, Miss Fairfax? Thank you. Detestable girl, but I require tea. <laughs> Sugar? No, thank you. Sugar isn't fashionable anymore.
to save my poor, innocent, trusting boy from the machinations of any other girl. There are no lengths to which I would not go. From the moment I saw you, I distrusted you. I felt you were false and deceitful. I am never deceived in such matters. My first impressions are invariably right. It <coughs> seems to me, Miss Fairfax, that I am trespassing on your valuable time. No doubt you have many other calls of a similar character to make in the neighborhood. <laughs> to be married to this young lady? Oh, to Dela for Cecily? <laughs> well, well, of course not. Oh. What could have put such an idea into your pretty little head? Thank you. You may. Dear Miss Fairfax, I knew there must be some error. The gentleman whose arm is at present around your waist is my guardian, Mr. John Worthing. I beg your pardon. This is Uncle Jack. Jack! Yeah. This is Ernest. My own love. Another please, Ernest. May I ask you, are you engaged to be married to this young lady? To what young lady? Good heavens, Gwendolyn. Yes, to good heavens, Gwendolyn. <laughs> I mean to Gwendolyn. Of course not. What can put such an idea into your pretty little head? Thank you. You may. I felt there must be some slight error. The gentleman who is now embracing you is my cousin. Mr. Algernon Moncrief. <laughs> Algernon Moncrief? Ah! Oh, is your name Algernon? I cannot deny it. Oh! Is your name really John? I could deny it if I liked. I could deny anything if I liked. But it certainly is John. It has been John for years. A gross deception has been practiced on us both. My poor wounded Cecily. <laughs> I would like to ask you. Where is your brother Ernest? And we are both engaged to be married to your brother Ernest. <laughs> and so it is a matter of some importance that we know where your brother Ernest is at present. Gwendolyn. Cecily, it is very painful for me to be forced to speak the truth. This is the first time in my life I've ever been reduced to such a painful position, and I'm, <laughs> I'm really quite inexperienced in doing anything of the kind. However, I will tell you quite frankly, that I have no brother, Ernest. I have no brother at all. I never had a brother in my life. And I certainly have not the smallest intention of ever having one in the future. <laughs> no brother at all? None. You've never had a brother of any kind? Never. Not even of any kind. <laughs> it would seem to me, Cecily, that neither of us is engaged to be married to anyone. It is not a very pleasant position for a young girl suddenly to find herself in, is it? Let us go into the house. They will hardly venture to follow us there. No. They're so cowardly, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> ghastly state of things is what you call bungering, I suppose. Yes, and a perfectly wonderful bungery it is too. <coughs> the most wonderful bungery of my entire life. Well, you have no right whatsoever to bungery here. That is absurd. One has the right to bungery wherever one chooses. Every serious bungerist knows that. Serious bungerist? Good heavens. Well, one has to be serious about something if one wants any amusement in life. I happen to be serious about bungering. What you were serious about, I have no idea. About absolutely everything, I should fancy. You have such an absolutely <coughs> trivial nature. Well, the only small satisfaction I have in the whole of this wretched business is that your friend Bunbury has quite exploded. You won't be able to run down to the country as often as you used to do, dear Algy. A very good thing, too. Your brother is a little off colour, isn't he, Jack? You won't be able to disappear to London quite so often as your wicked custom was. And not a bad thing, too. As for your conduct towards Miss Carty, I must say, you're taking in such a sweet, yeah. simple, innocent girl like that is quite inexcusable, to say nothing of the fact that she is my ward. I can see absolutely no possible defence whatsoever. You're deceiving a brilliant, clever, thoroughly experienced young lady like Miss Fairfax to say nothing of the fact she is my cousin. I wanted to be engaged to Gwendolyn, that is all. 
I love her. Well, I only want you to be engaged to Cecily. I adore her. There is no chance of your marrying Miss Cardew. Well, I really don't think, Jack, there's much chance of you and Miss Fairfax being united. Well, there's no business of yours. If it was my business, I wouldn't talk about it. It's very vulgar to talk about one's own business. Only people like stockbrokers do that, and then merely at dinner parties. How you can sit there, calmly eating muffins when we are in this horrible trouble, I can't make out. You seem to me to be perfectly heartless. Well, I can't eat muffins in an agitated manner. <laughs> the butter would probably get on my cups. One should always eat muffins quite calmly. It's the only way to eat them. I say it is perfectly heartless you're eating muffins at all, under the circumstances. When I'm in trouble, eating is the only thing that consoles me. In fact, when I'm in really great trouble, as anyone who knows me intimately well will tell you, I refuse everything except food and drink. I am presently eating muffins because I am unhappy. Besides, I'm particularly fond of muffins. Yes, well, there's no reason for you to eat them all in that greedy way. I wish you would have some tea cake. I hate tea cake. Good heavens, I suppose a man ate his own muffins in his own garden. But you have just said it's perfectly heartless eating muffins. But it was perfectly heartless for you under the circumstances. That's a very different thing. That may be, but the muffins remain the same. Algy, I wish to goodness you would go. You can't send me away without my dinner. It's absurd. No one ever does, apart from vegetarians and people like that. <laughs> Besides, I've made an, an arrangement with Dr. Chasuble to be christened at quarter to six under the name of Ernest. <laughs> My dear fellow, the sooner you give up that nonsense, the better. I made arrangements this morning with Dr. Chasuble to be christened myself at 5.30, and I naturally would take the name of Ernest. Gwendolyn would wish it. You can't both be christened Ernest, it's absurd. Besides, I have every right to be christened if I like. There is no evidence at all that I was ever christened by anybody, and I think it extremely probable I never was, and so thought Dr. Chasuble. It is entirely different in your case. You have been christened already. Yes, but I haven't been christened in many years. Yes, but you have been christened. That is the important thing. Quite so. So I know my constitution can stand it. I must say, Jack, if you're not sure about your ever having been christened before, it's very dangerous of you to venture on it now. It may make you unwell. <laughs> After all, you can hardly have forgotten that a very closely connected relative of yours was very nearly carried off by a severe chill in Paris last week. <laughs> yes, but as you said yourself, a severe chill <coughs> is not hereditary. It used to be, but it may be now. Science is always making such wonderful progress in things. Oh, that is nonsense. You're always talking <coughs> nonsense. Jack, you are at the muffins again. <laughs> I wish you wouldn't. There are only two left. You know I'm particularly fond of muffins. But I hate tea cake. And yet you allow them to be served up for your guests. What ideas you have of hospitality? Algernon, I have already asked you to go. I don't want you here. Now why don't you go? I haven't quite finished my tea yet. Besides, there's still one muffin left. <laughs> follow us into the house, as anyone else would have done, seems to me to show they do have some sense of shame there. They have been eating muffins. That looks like repentance. <laughs> <laughs> they don't seem to notice us at all. Well, couldn't you cough? But I haven't got a cough. <laughs> By looking at us. What a front thing. <laughs> <laughs> approaching. That's very forward of them. Let us maintain a dignified silence. Certainly. It's the only thing for us to do now. Dignified silence seems to produce an unpleasant effect. A most distasteful one. But we will not be the first to speak. <coughs> Certainly not. Certainly. <coughs> there is something I must ask you. Much depends on your reply. Gwendolyn, your common sense is invaluable. <coughs> Mr. Moncrief, kindly answer me the following question. Why did you pretend to be my guardian's brother? In order that I might have an opportunity of meeting you. Certainly seems a satisfactory reply, does it not? <laughs> yes, dear, if you can believe him. I don't. 
that does not affect the wonderful beauty of his answer. Mm. Mm. In matters of grave importance, style and sincerity is the vital thing. Mr. Worthing, what explanation can you offer to me for pretending to have a brother? Was it in order that you might have an opportunity of coming up to town to see me as often as possible? How could you doubt it, Miss Fairfax? I have the gravest doubts on the subject, and I intend to crush them. This is not the moment for German skepticism. <laughs> Their explanations appear to be quite satisfactory, do they not? Especially Mr. Worthing's. That seems to me to have the stamp of truth upon it. I more than agree with what Mr. Moncrief said. His voice alone inspires absolute credulity. Then you think we should forgive them? Yes. I mean, no. <laughs> True. I have forgotten. There are principles at stake one cannot surrender. But who should tell them? Well, the task is hardly a pleasant one. Could we not both speak at the same time? <coughs> An excellent idea. I nearly always speak at the same time as other people. <laughs> Will you take the time for me? Certainly. <laughs> Your Christian <laughs> names are still an insuperable barrier. That, that is all. Our Christian names? Uh, is that all? Is that all? We're going to be Christian this afternoon. This afternoon. For my sake, you're prepared to do this terrible thing? I am. To please me, you were willing to face this fearful ordeal? I am. How absurd to talk of the equality of the sexes. Where questions of self-sacrifice are concerned, men are infinitely beyond us. We are. They have no question of which we women know. Absolutely nothing. Darling. Darling. <coughs> Lady Bracknell. Oh, oh good heavens. <laughs> Gwendolyn, what does this mean? Merely that I am engaged to be married to Mr. Worthing more. Come here. Sit down. Sit down immediately. <clears throat> Appraise, sir, of my daughter's sudden flight by her trusty maid, whose confidence I purchased by means of a small coin. I followed her at once by a luggage train. Her unhappy father is, I am glad to say, under the impression that she is attending a more than usually lengthy lecture by the university extension scheme on the influence of a permanent income on thought. <laughs> I do not propose to undeceive him. Indeed, I have never undeceived him on any question. I would consider it wrong. But you will clearly understand that all communication between yourself and my daughter must cease immediately from this moment. On this point, as indeed on all points, I am firm. I am engaged to be married to Gwendolyn, Lady Bracknell. You are nothing of the kind, sir. And now, as regards Algernon. Algernon, may I ask if it is in this house that your invalid friend, Mr. Bunbury, resides? Oh, no. Bunbury doesn't live here anymore. Uh, uh, Bunbury's somewhere else at present. In fact, the Bunbury's dead. Dead? When did Mr. Bunbury die? His death must have been extremely sudden. Oh, I killed him off this afternoon. I mean, Bunbury died this afternoon. Well, what did he die of? The Bunbury. He was quite exploded. Exploded? <laughs> was he the victim of a revolutionary outrage? I had no idea Mr. Bunbury was interested in social legislation. <laughs> so he is well punished for his morbidity. No, my dear Augusta, what I went, meant was that Bunbury was found out. The doctors found out that Bunbury couldn't live, <coughs> so Bunbury died. He seems to have had great confidence in the opinion of his physician. <laughs> <laughs> I am glad he made up his mind, however, to some definite course of action and acted under proper medical advice. Now that we've got rid of this, Mr. Bunbury, may I ask, Mr. Worthing, who is that young person whose hand my nephew Algernon is now holding in what seems to me a peculiarly unnecessary manner? <laughs> <laughs> that lady is Miss Cecily Cardew, my ward. I'm engaged to be married to Cecily, Aunt Augusta. I beg your pardon. Mr. Moncrief and I are engaged to be married, Lady Bracknell. <coughs> I do not know if there is anything peculiarly exciting about the air in this particular part of Hertfordshire, but the number of engagements that go on seems to me considerably about the proper average that statistics have laid down for our guidance. <laughs> I think some preliminary inquiry on my part would not be out of place. Uh, Mr. Worthing, 
Is Miss Cardew at all connected with any of the larger railway stations? <laughs> <laughs> I merely desire information. Until yesterday, I had no idea that there were any families or persons whose origin was a terminus. <laughs> <laughs> and Miss Cardew is the granddaughter of the late Mr. Thomas Cardew of 149 Belgrave Square, SW, a Gervais Park, Dorking, Surrey, and the Sporran of Fifeshire, NB. <laughs> that sounds not unsatisfactory. Three addresses always inspire confidence, even in tradesmen. <laughs> but what proof do I have of their authenticity? I have carefully, uh, I have carefully preserved the court guide of the period, Lady Bracken. They are open to your inspection. Well, I have no grave errors in that publication. Uh, Miss Cardew's family solicitors are Messrs. Markby, Markby, and Markby. Markby, Markby, Markby. A firm of the very highest position in their profession. Indeed, I'm told that one of the Mr. Markby's is occasionally to be seen at dinner parties. So far, I am satisfied. How extremely kind of you, Lady Bracknell. I have also in my possession, uh, you will be pleased to hear, certificates of Miss Cardew's birth, <coughs> baptism, whooping cough, registration, vaccination, confirmation, and the measles. Oh, both the German and the English variety. <laughs> Life crowded with incident, I see. <laughs> Though perhaps somewhat too exciting for a young girl, I myself am not in favour of premature experiences. Come, Gwendolyn, the time approaches for our departure. We have not a moment to lose. As a matter of form, Mr. Worthing, I had better ask you if Miss Cardew has any little fortune. Oh, about £130,000 in the funds, that is all. Goodbye, Lady Bracknell. So pleased to have seen you. seems the most attractive young lady now that I come to <laughs> Few girls of the present day have any really solid qualities, any of the qualities that last and improve with time. We live, I regret to say, in an age of surfaces. Come on here, dear. Written child, your dress is sadly simple and your hair seems almost as nature might have left it. Oh, but we can soon alter all that. A thoroughly experienced French maid produces a really marvellous result in a very short space of time. I remember recommending one to young lady Larkin, and after three months, her own husband did not know her. After six months, nobody knew her. <laughs> no, the side view is what I want. Yes, quite as I expected. There are distinct social possibilities in your profile. The two weak points in our age are its want of principle and its want of profile. The chin a little higher, dear. Style very largely depends on the way the chin is worn. They're worn very high just at present. Algernon? Yes, Aunt Augusta. There are distinct social possibilities in Miss Cardew's profile. <laughs> Cecily is the sweetest, dearest, prettiest girl in all the world, and I don't care tuppence about social possibilities. Never speak disrespectfully of society, Algernon. Only people who can't get into it do that. <laughs> <laughs> dear child. Of course you know that Algernon has nothing but his debts to depend on, but I do not approve of mercenary marriages. When I met Lord Bracknell, I had no fortune of any kind, but I never dreamed for a moment of allowing that to stand in my way. <laughs> well, I suppose I must give my consent. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. Cecily, you may kiss me. Thank you, Lady Bracknell. You may also address me as Aunt Augusta for the future. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. The marriage, I think, had better take place quite soon. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. To speak frankly, I am not in favour of long engagements. To give people the opportunity of finding out each other's characters before marriage, which I think is never advisable. <laughs> I beg your pardon for interrupting you, Lady Bracknell, but this engagement is quite out of the question. I am Miss Cardew's guardian, and she cannot marry without my consent until she comes of age. Now, that consent I absolutely decline to give. Well, upon what grounds, may I ask? Algernon is an extremely, I may almost say, ostentatiously eligible young man. He has nothing, but he looks everything. What more can one desire? <laughs> <laughs> it pains me very much to have to speak frankly to you, Lady Bracknell, about your nephew. The fact is, I do not approve at all of his moral character. I suspect him of being untruthful. Untruthful? My nephew, Algernon? Impossible. He's an Oxonian. I fear there can be no possible doubt about the matter. This afternoon, during my temporary absence in London on an important question of romance, he obtained admission to my house by the means of the false pretense of being my brother. 
Under an assumed name, he drank, I have just been informed by my butler, an entire pint bottle of my Perrier Jouet Brut 89, a wine I was especially reserving for myself. Continuing his disgraceful deception, he succeeded in the course of the afternoon in alienating the affections of my only ward. He subsequently stayed to tea and devoured every single muffin. And what makes his conduct all the more heartless is that he was perfectly well aware from the first that I have no brother, that I never had a brother, and that I don't intend to have a brother, not even of any kind. I distinctly told him so myself yesterday afternoon. Uh, Mr. Worthy, after careful consideration, I have decided entirely to overlook my nephew's conduct towards you. Mm -hmm. That is very generous of you, Lady Bracknell. And my own decision, however, is unalterable. I decline to give my consent. Come over here, sweet child. <laughs> How old are you, dear? Well, I'm really only 18, but I always admit to 20 when I go to evening parties. <laughs> you are quite right in making some slight alteration. Indeed, no woman should ever be quite accurate about her age. It looks so calculating. 18, but admitting to 20 at evening parties. Well, it will not be very long before you're of age and free from the restraints of tutelage. So I don't think your guardian's consent is, after all, a matter of any great importance. Uh, pray excuse me for interrupting you again, Lady Bracknell, <coughs> but I think it only fair to tell you that according to the terms of her grandfather's will, uh, Miss Cardew does not legally come of age till she is 35. <laughs> <laughs> that does not seem to me to be a very grave objection. 35 is a very attractive age. London society is full of women of the very highest birth who have of their own free choice remained 35 for years. <laughs> Lady Dumbledore is an instance in point. To my own knowledge, she has remained 35 ever since she arrived at the age of 40, which was many years ago now. <laughs> I see no reason why our own dear Cecily should not be even still more attractive at the age you mentioned than she is at present. There will be a large accumulation of property. <laughs> Algy. Could you wait for me until I was 35? Of course I could. You know I could. Yes, I felt it instinctively. But I couldn't wait all that time. I hate waiting for five minutes for anybody. It always makes me rather prompt. I'm not punctual myself, I know. But I do like punctuality in others. And waiting, even to be married, it's quite out of the question. Then what is to be done, Cecily? <coughs> I don't know, Mr. Montague. <coughs> My dear Mr. Worthing, as Miss Cardew states quite positively that she cannot wait till she is 35, a remark which I am bound to say seems to me to show a somewhat impatient nature. <laughs> I would beg of you to reconsider your decision. But My dear Lady Bracknell, <coughs> the matter is entirely in your own hands. The moment you consent to my marriage to Gwendolyn, I will most gladly allow your nephew to form an alliance with my ward. You must be quite aware that what you propose is out of the question. <laughs> then a passionate celibacy is all that any of us can look forward to. <laughs> that is not the destiny I propose for Gwendolyn. Algernon, of course, can choose for himself. Come, dear. We have already missed five, if not six, trains. To miss any more might expose us to comment on the platform. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's quite ready for the christenings. The christenings, sir? Is that not somewhat premature? <laughs> Both these gentlemen expressed a desire for immediate baptism. At their age? The idea is grotesque and irreligious. I do not like a video to be baptised. I will not hear of such excesses. Lord Bracknell would be highly displeased if he learned that was the way you wasted your time and money. <laughs> Am I to understand, then, there will be no christenings at all this afternoon? I don't think that as things are now, it will be of much practical value to either of us, Dr. Chancellor. I am grieved to hear such sentiments from you, Mr. Worthing. They savour of the heretical views of the Anabaptists. <coughs> views which I have totally refuted in four of my un <coughs> unpublished sermons. However, as your current mood <coughs> appears to be one peculiarly <coughs> secular, I shall return to the church at once. Indeed, I have just been informed by the pew opener that for the last hour and a half, this prism has been waiting for me in the vestry. Miss Prism? Did I hear you mention a Miss Prism? Yes, Lady Bracknell. I, I'm on my way to join her. Well, pray allow me to detain you for a moment. This matter may prove to be one of vital importance to Lord Bracknell and myself. Is this 
Christmas prism a female and repellent aspect, remotely connected with education? <laughs> she is the most cultivated of ladies and the very picture of respectability. It is obviously the same person. <laughs> <laughs> Might I inquire what position she holds in your household? I am a celibate, madam. Mm -hmm. Miss Prism, Lady Bracknell, has been for the last three years Miss Cardew's esteemed governess and valued companion. In spite of what I hear of her, I must see her at once. Let her be sent for. She approaches. She is nigh. I was told that you expected me in the vestry, dear. Canon, I have been waiting for you there for an hour and three quarters. Prism! Come here, Prism. Prism, where is that baby? <laughs> 28 years ago, Prism, you left Lord Bracknell's house, number 104, Upper Grosvenor Street, in charge of a perambulator that contained a baby of the male sex. You never returned. A few weeks later, through the elaborate investigations of the Metropolitan Police, the perambulator was discovered at midnight standing by itself in a remote corner of Bayswater. It contained the manuscript of a three-volume novel of more than usually revolting <laughs> sentimentality. <laughs> but the baby was not there. Prison, where is that baby? Lady Bracknell, I admit with shame that I do not know. I only wish I did. The plain facts of the case are these. On the morning of the day you mentioned, a day that is forever branded in my memory, I prepared as usual to take the baby out in its perambulator. I had also with me a somewhat old but capacious handbag in which I had intended to place the manuscript of a work of fiction I had written during my few unoccupied hours. In a moment of mental abstraction for which I could never forgive myself, I deposited the manuscript bassinet and placed the baby in the handbag. But where did you deposit the handbag? Oh, do not ask me, Mr. Worthy. Miss Prism, this is a matter of no small importance to me. I insist on knowing where you deposited the handbag that contained that infant. In the cloakroom of one of the larger railway stations in London. <laughs> what railway station? Victoria! Right? I must retire to my room for a moment. Gwendolyn, wait here for me. You're not too long. I'll wait here for you all my life. <laughs> <laughs> what do you suppose this means, Lady Bracknell? I dare not even suspect, Dr. Chasuble. I need hardly tell you that in families of high position, strange coincidences are not supposed to occur. They are hard to consider the thing. Uncle Jack seems strangely agitated. <laughs> Guardian has a very emotional nature. It sounds like people are having an argument. I dislike arguments of any kind. They're always louder and often convincing. It is not now. <laughs> I wish he would arrive at some conclusion. Suspense is terrible. I have it at last. <laughs> is this the handbag, Miss Prism? Examine it carefully before you answer. The happiness of more than one life depends on your answer. It seems to be mine. Yes, here is the injury it received through the upsetting of a Gower Street omnibus in younger and happier days. <coughs> here is the stain on the lining caused by the explosion of a temperance beverage. <laughs> An incident that occurred at Leamington. And here on the lock of my initials, I had forgotten that in an extravagant mood, I had had the place <coughs> Oh, yes. The bag is undoubtedly mine. I'm delighted to have it so unexpectedly returned to me. It has been a great inconvenience being without it all my <laughs> Miss Prism, more is returned to you than this handbag. I am the baby you placed in it. You? Yes. Mother! I am unmarried, Mr. Worthing! Unmarried? Now, that is a serious blow. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll 
after all, who, who has the right to cast a stone at one who has suffered? Cannot repentance wipe out an act of folly? Why should there be one law for men and another for women? Mother, I forgive you. There is some error. There is the lady who can tell you who you really are. Lady Bracknell, I hate to seem inquisitive. <laughs> Would you kindly inform me who I am? Well, I'm afraid the news I have to give you will not altogether please you. You are the son of my poor sister, Mrs. Moncrief, and consequently, Algernon's elder brother. <laughs> Algernon's elder brother? Then I have a brother after all. I knew I had a brother. I always said I had a brother. Cecily, how could you ever doubt it that I had a brother? Dr. Chasuble, my unfortunate brother. <laughs> Miss Prism, my unfortunate brother. Gwendolyn, <laughs> my unfortunate brother. Algy, you young scoundrel. You'll have to treat me with more respect in future. You've never behaved like a brother to me in all your life. Well, not until today, old boy, I admit. I did my best, however, though I was a little out of practice. <laughs> my own one. But what own are you? Well, what's your Christian name? Now you're someone else. Good heavens, I've forgotten that point. Your decision on the subject of my name is irrevocable, I suppose. I never change, except in my affection. <laughs> what a noble lady you have, Gwendolyn. Then the question had better be cleared up at once. Aunt Augusta. <laughs> a moment. At the time that Miss Prism left me in the handbag, had I been christened already? Every luxury that money could buy, <laughs> including christening, had been lavished on you by your fond and doting parents. Then I was christened. That is settled. Now, what name was I given? Let me know the worst. Uh, being the eldest son, you were naturally christened after your father. Yes, <laughs> but what was my father's Christian name? I cannot at the present moment recall what the gentleman's oh. Christian name was, but I have no doubt he had one. He was eccentric, I admit, but only in later years, and that was a result of the Indian climate and marriage and indigestion and other things of that sort. Oh. Algy, can you not recollect what our father's Christian name was? We were never on speaking terms, old boy. He died before I was a year old. Oh. His name would appear in the army list of the period, I suppose, Aunt Augusta. Well, the general was essentially a man of peace, except in his domestic life. But I dare say his name would appear in any military directory. Well, the army list for the last 40 years are here. These delightful records should be my constant study. M. Generals. Malum, Maxbum, Magley. What ghastly names they have. Markby, Migsby, Moggs, Moncrief. Lieutenant 1840, Captain, Lieutenant Colonel, Colonel, General 1869, Christian names. Aha! Ernest. Job. <laughs> I always told you, Gwendolyn, that my name was Ernest in time. But it is Ernest after all. I mean, it naturally is Ernest. Yes, I remember now that General was called Ernest. I knew I had some particular reason to dislike you with it. <laughs> Ernest. My own Ernest. I felt from the first you could have no other name. Gwendolyn, it's a terrible thing for a man to suddenly find out that all his life has been speaking nothing but the truth. <laughs> can you forgive me? I can. But I feel that you're sure to change. Oh, my own one. <coughs> Letitia. <coughs> Frederick, at last. Cecily, at last. Gwendolyn, at last. My nephew, you seem to be displaying signs of triviality. On the contrary, Aunt Augusta, I've now realised for the first time in my life the vital importance of being earnest. <laughs>